Good evening and welcome. I'm Hannah Weissman, Executive Director of the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life, and it's my privilege to welcome you and our distinguished speaker this evening. Tonight's lecture is part of our series of programming offered in conjunction with the Magnus's current exhibition, Cities and Wars, Roman Vishniak in Berlin and Jerusalem, 1947-1967. I invite you to visit the exhibition in person and to join us for the upcoming events in the series, including a screening of Laura Bialis's new film, Vishniak, at the Pacific Film Archive tomorrow at 4 p.m., and a lecture by SF State Goldman Professor in Israel Studies, Aaron Kaplan, titled 1967, The Year That Transformed Israel, here at the Magnus on March 5th. Cities and Wars features photographs from the Roman Vishniak Archive, a collection of approximately 30,000 images, audiovisual materials, correspondence, and memorabilia. In 2018, Mara Vishniak Cohn donated the archive, which contains her father's life work to the Magnus. We thank Toby Philanthropies, the Libitsky Family Foundation, Richard Nagler, and an anonymous donor for supporting the care and processing of the Roman Vishniak archive at the Magnus. I also want to acknowledge that we find ourselves living in a time when war is directly and personally affecting people across many communities, including those connected with the Magnus. Neither Cities and Wars nor tonight's program addresses the war in Israel and Gaza, although it continues to weigh heavily on our hearts and minds. At the end of her lecture, Professor Gerstenblith will take questions. Please use the Q&A feature in your Zoom toolbar to submit your questions. It's now time to introduce our speaker. Patty Gerstenblith is Distinguished Research Professor of Law at DePaul University and Director of its Center for Art, Museum, and Cultural Heritage Law. In 2011, President Obama appointed her to serve as chair of the President's Cultural Property Advisory Committee in the Department of State, on which she had previously served in the Clinton administration. Since 2020, she has served as president of the board of directors of the U.S. Committee of the Blue Shield and chair of the Blue Shield International Working Group on Countering Trafficking of Cultural Objects. She lectures and publishes widely in the United States and internationally on the protection of cultural property during armed conflict, preservation of archeological heritage, and the trade in archeological and other cultural objects. Her book, Cultural Objects in Repar Reparative Justice, a Legal and Historical Analysis, was published by Oxford University Press in the fall of 2023. Among her many distinctions, Professor Gerstenblith is a member of the American Bar Association's International Art and Cultural Heritage Law Steering Committee and the Archaeological Institute of America's Charles Eliot Norton National Lecturer for this academic year. She received her AB from Bryn Mawr College, PhD in Art History and Anthropology from Harvard University, JD from Northwestern University, and an honorary doctorate of humane letters from Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. Before joining DePaul Law Faculty, Professor Gerstenblith clerked for the Honorable Richard D. Kadahi of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. Please join me in welcoming Professor Patty Gerstenblith to the Magnus. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah, for the introduction and particularly for inviting me to speak to the Magnus um, and especially your flexibility in switching to the online format um, when it became uh, difficult for me to travel to San Francisco. So I'm very happy to be here virtually. Uh, I wish I could be there in person, but this seems to be second best. There are several people also that I want to thank who've helped me out uh, during a difficult technological week uh, that I had. Uh, my colleague at DePaul University, Dr. Maura Kersel, uh, two of my Blue Shield board member uh, colleagues, uh, Dr. Brian Daniels and Jane Levine. And I also want to thank the founding president of the U.S. Committee of the Blue Shield, 
Corey Wegner, who is also the director of the Smithsonian's Cultural Rescue Initiative. Uh, many of the slides, particularly those that talk about Blue Shield, are uh, her slides, and so I appreciate her uh, sharing those with me. Um, so can I have the first slide, please? Thank you. So as I begin, um, and I think this is inherent in a lot of what seems like the Magnus Collection does, uh, we must never forget about people, even while we talk about destruction of heritage and property. We always have to remember the people that are part of it, who made it, and to whom the heritage was meaningful. And so I begin with an image that I'll return to later of the Mariupol Theater in Ukraine. On the left, how it looked in 2019, and on the right, after it was bombed by Russian forces in 2022. But behind the theater is that it was used as a shelter for about 1,200 civilians, of whom about half, roughly 600, were killed in the bombing attack. And many times when we talk about destruction through her destruction of heritage, it is also people who are suffering and people who are killed. Um, so we must keep that in mind, even as I talk about uh, my presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Oop. Yes, there we go. Uh, yeah, got it. <laughs> Uh, one of my technological problems this week uh, meant that I couldn't share my screen and run the um, PowerPoint myself. So um, Hannah is doing that very kindly for me. Um, so the destruction and looting and theft of cultural objects goes back to antiquity. Uh, long, long history symbolized here by the scene from the Arch of Titus in Rome of the sack and destruction and theft of objects from the Second Temple in Jerusalem. And you can see here that there are religious items that are being carried away by the Romans. So in antiquity, all the way up to today, very often when cultural heritage is attacked, it's because of its significance to people. It is a way for the attacker, for the victor, to show their, that they have conquered and also to, in many cases, erase the individual cultural identity or religious identity of the people who have been, uh, who have been conquered. So this was certainly true in the Roman period, and we'll see that we certainly have that at times in the present as well. Uh, next slide, please. Moving forward very quickly, some uh, 1700 or so years, um, I move into what I view as the beginning of the modern era, which is really the second half of the 18th century, the time when the large universal museums such as the Louvre and the British Museum were founded, also the time when archaeology and anthropology found their scientific footing, even though there were problematic aspects to that as well. But in Napoleon's conquest of much of Europe, he also wanted to take cultural objects of significance from all over Europe, but particularly from Rome to Paris, to recreate Paris as the new Rome. And by doing so, he claimed, and many of the French artists at the time claimed, that by taking cultural objects and artworks to, to Paris, they were in fact benefiting not only French artists and the French uh, population, populace, but also benefiting everyone else in the world because the French viewed themselves by their superiority as being the best people to take care of cultural objects on behalf of all the world. And if you look down, I can't really point it out to you, but it's sort of the center of, this is a parade of objects being brought from Italy to Paris to be placed in um, the Louvre, what wasn't called the Louvre at the time. Um, and we'll see those again in just a moment. So the next slide, please. At the end of the Napoleonic Wars, in the um, 1815, the French were required by the victorious allies uh, led by the British to return the cultural objects that had been taken. And here you see on the left, the horses of St. Mark's, San Marco in Venice, on the right, the Laocoon, um, a Roman sculpture that's a copy actually of an earlier Greek sculpture that was returned to Rome. And the horses in particular set a principle, well, we see two principles come out of this. First of all, that at the end of military conflict, cultural objects that were taken should be returned. And second, they should be returned to the place from which they last came. We know in the case of the horses that they were not originate in Venice. They were taken by the Venetians during 
the Fourth Crusade in, I believe it was 1204. These were taken from where today is Istanbul. And they probably didn't originate in Istanbul either. They were probably made somewhere in Greece, although we're not sure where, perhaps Corinth. So rather than trying to send them back to the original place of location, uh, for a number of reasons, partly political amongst the allies, the, the allies of the British, it was the easiest to return them to the place from which they had been taken, about which it was pretty clear where Napoleon had taken them. It should be mentioned that although the French were supposed to return everything that Napoleon had taken, in fact, only slightly more than half of the objects were returned. And this constant back and forth among the European countries actually laid the groundwork for uh, later takings by the French, by the Germans, off and on, leading all the way up to it, and including the Second World War. Um, so we come out of the Napoleonic era in 1815 with the first modern example of restitution of cultural objects, rather than the victor taking them, and these were offered to the British, the British turned them down, uh, rather than the victor taking them, that they were returned to the place from which they had been taken. But we also have a second principle, and the next slide, please. Established at just about the same time, a British, uh, a, um, during the, um, uh, in the, uh, sorry, uh, there was a ship bringing uh, paintings from Italy to Philadelphia, because in the United States, we often view, uh, those of us who are not Native Americans, view our heritage as coming from somewhere else. And certainly in the earlier centuries of uh, the European colonization of North America, that heritage was viewed as coming from Europe and the Mediterranean area. So in the early days, uh, the um, American colonies and the early United States tried to bring artworks from Europe. But during the War of 1812, the British intercepted an American ship bringing objects to Philadelphia, these paintings. And they were take, the ship was taken to Nova Scotia, which of course was at that time part of the British Empire. But the museum asked the judge there, British judge, to return the paintings to Philadelphia. And remarkably, arguably without much legal precedent, the judge there determined that the paintings were not lawful war booty, but rather should be returned to the place to which they were intended to go. Um, they were distinct and as a uh, British judge did not want to be and pointed out, uh, did not want to be that like that little tyrant Napoleon who was going through Europe and looting and stealing under the guise of armed conflict. The judge also remarkably, um, and I don't really understand how he figured this out, but basically he said, once those people in the United States get some culture, the United States and Britain will be the closest of allies and the closest of friends. And remarkably enough that actually, I don't know if it was a prerequisite that we get some culture first, but it certainly turned out to be true. Um, interestingly, uh, you'll see these two paintings actually say that they are in the museum in Nova Scotia. And you might say, hmm, the judge allowed them to go. How come they're still in Nova Scotia? That's because in the early 1950s, the Philadelphia Museum of Art voluntarily uh, donated these to the Nova Scotia Museum of Fine Arts in gratitude for the fact that uh, the judge in Nova Scotia had allowed the rest of the paintings to, all of the paintings actually, to go to Philadelphia, where the rest of them are, still remain today. Um, next slide, please. So at the end of Napoleonic Wars, uh, present at the Battle of Waterloo was a young Prussian, Prussian a uh, soldier, but also a scholar named Francis Lieber. Uh, he was also a classicist. And after studying in Italy and Greece, he came to the United States, first in South Carolina, and later uh, in Manhattan to what today is Columbia University. He was not a lawyer, but an historian, but a military historian. And there was part of a debate all through the 19th century as to what is the best way to conduct warfare? What is the more humane way? Should war be fought all out and get over with as quickly as possible as a humane approach? Or should um, there be limits placed on how war is conducted? Uh, that debate uh, continues today, but for the most part, we accept that there are, in the interest of humanitarian concerns, there are limits that are placed on how war should be conducted. One of the things that Lieber said 
uh, was that there should not be war conducted in such a way that it made returning to peace at the end of the conflict too difficult. So for example, the Libra Code prohibited the poisoning of wells. Um, now, I also personally think that perhaps he was, um, he had sons who were fighting on both sides of the Civil War and was perhaps influenced particularly on the treatment of prisoners of war by that. But he was asked uh, by President Lincoln and the Secretary of the Army at the time to draft a code of conduct. And this is the first written code of conduct for the U.S. Army. And this was promulgated in early 1863. This then became the principles. This is a uh, code that deals with all sorts of manners of conducting warfare, um, but included some provisions for what we today call cultural property. These principles were picked up in uh, the early Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907. Again, conventions that deal with all aspects of conducting um, conflict, armed conflict, but uh, included, I will say, and I'm definitely paraphrasing here, three core principles that we see carried through international law today. First of all, the intentional targeting of cultural sites is prohibited so far as possible. As I said, there are some differences in the exact terminology of the conventions. Second, pillage and seizure of movable cultural objects is prohibited. And third, any objects that are taken during the conflict should be returned at the end of the conflict or at the end of occupation. Um, so we have those three core principles and these conventions, the 1899-1907 Hague Conventions, which they are recognized as part of what's called customary international law, uh, were the basis for international law during both world wars. Um, next slide, please. Now, I just wanna give a brief uh, comment about what international law can and cannot do, because I think that the ability of international law to restrain or to enforce certain conduct is often overstated and often misunderstood. There are generally three sources of international law, conventions and treaties, such as the ones I was just talking about, uh, resolutions, declarations, and recommendations, which are various standard setting instruments or statements made usually by international organizations. For the most part, these are not enforceable. They are what we call soft law, with the exception of UN Security Council resolutions, which if adopted under the right part of the UN Charter is binding on all UN member states. Um, the third source is what we call customary international law, which is aspects of law that are so universally recognized and followed that they are considered to be binding on all countries, even those that have not ratified a particular convention. And secondly, the second aspect is conventions and treaties are only binding legally on countries, first of all, that have ratified them. And of course, customary international law is an exception to that. And in many cases, depending on not only the convention itself, but the interpretation that a particular country gives it, uh, the convention is only legally binding after a particular country has enacted domestic implementing legislation. And that legislation, that domestic law, is what in fact determines the obligations of that country under the international convention. Um, so those are the basic principles of how international law works. Um, next slide. Um, as I mentioned, those early Hague conventions were the international law during both world wars. Uh, and you see on the left an image of the um, uh, one of the cathedrals in England that were bombed by the Germans, uh, what are called the Bedecker Raids. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Bedecker guys, but they're kind of like the Rick Steves guides of, of, um, of the past. And they were called the Bedecker Raids because basically the Germans were following all the major historical, particularly religious um, sites in Southern England to bomb and destroy them. On the right it is Dresden, which was bombed by the British at the very end of the war, arguably um, not with any real strategic or military purpose, but probably out of revenge uh, for the bombing that Germany had, did to them, had done to them. Um, revenge is not an acceptable motivation and any actions that are taken need to have a military purpose. 
Um, so whether the UK committed a war crime at that time, um, obviously they were, no one was ever prosecuted for it. And so it um, is one of those things that some of us like to sit around and debate. Um, but there was no prosecution, but there are quite a few people who believe that in fact, the British did commit a war crime in that action. Um, next slide. Um, some of you may have seen the film, uh, The Monuments Men, uh, and the sculpture in the top right, the uh, Madonna uh, in Bruges that was done by Michelangelo features uh, pretty prominently in the film. I will just say much of the film was not actually accurate, um, made a good story, but um, did not actually portray how what are called the monuments officers operated during the war. On the right, you see that uh, the, the Germans did store up many artworks that they looted and stole, particularly in Western Europe. In Eastern Europe, the Germans mostly destroyed, but in Western Europe, they um, stole and looted and took artworks to, and when I say they didn't destroy, I mean just with respect to artworks. Um, and here you see the three major um, American generals, Eisenhower, Bradley, and Patton, inspecting some of those stores in salt mines where the Germans have kept them for safekeeping and where the atmospheric temperature is very, um, is a, conducive to preserving the works of art. The allies, particularly the Americans and the British, established what were called monuments, fine arts and archives teams of officers. And you see them in the center at the bottom. These were individuals uh, and the film is about them. These are individuals who were tasked, first of all, with notifying the American and British military as to important cultural sites or um, repositories that should not be bombed if possible. And towards the end of the war to collect artworks that the Germans had taken, bring them to collecting points and then work on returning them. They returned very quickly those that were easily identifiable. Um, such as the Bruges Madonna, which went back, and many other famous works of art, or works that came from known and documented collections were returned fairly quickly at the end of the war. However, the artworks that the Germans did not take for themselves, uh, because they were viewed as degenerate art, were often sold onto the market, and they ended up in collections, particularly in the UK and the US. Um, next slide, please. And we have litigation that's still ongoing today to resolve um, who should own, what should be returned to the victims and the heirs of the victims of the Holocaust. Um, and I'll just mention two current issues. One is the collection of Fritz Grumbaum, who was a cabaret artist in Vienna before the war. Uh, and he had assembled a pretty significant collection of Sheila drawings. And you see four of them here, three of them, have already been the subject of litigation. And the one on the top right, the Russian war prisoner, is still in litigation. It is in the Art Institute here in Chicago. Um, and there is a, a lawsuit pending between the Art Institute and the Grunbaum heirs, while also the New York uh, District Attorney um, has attempted to seize the drawing here in Chicago as well. Uh, the question, uh, there are a lot of factual questions that are unresolved as to whether the collection, the Grunbaum collection was actually stolen or not. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of that because um, it would take about an hour to do that. But if there are questions, I'd be happy to talk about it more. Um, but also the question whether the heirs waited too long to sue, because when you wait and evidence is lost or, vic or potential witnesses have died in the meantime, uh, it becomes very difficult to prove a case. So some of these cases get barred by the passage of time. And the next slide. Some other litigation, particularly the, the Picasso on the right, which is at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, a slightly older case involving this other painting. Um, that question has come up. I mean, it's one thing to steal something outright. It's another to force somebody to sell something, a forced sale or a sale under duress. And several of the cases now involve sales under duress, people who sold their collections in order to have money to escape from Germany or to pay uh, a flight tax or to bribe uh, German guards or um, uh, officials to let them leave. Um, so, so far, this was the allegation made with the Picasso and the court in New York. Uh, 
decided that even the, that it, that circumstance did not meet the definition of a sale under duress, and therefore uh, the taking or the sale of that painting should not be viewed the same as a of a taking or a theft. Um, so this is uh, the tip of the iceberg of ongoing litigation some 80 or so years after these artworks were taken. Um, and there are other cases, and some of you may have seen the film, Woman in Gold, involved in the Altman collection, which raised some similar and some different questions as well. Next slide. At the end of the Second World War, uh, the international community adopted three major conventions. Um, the first of these was the Genocide Convention, drafted by Raphael Lemkin, who uh, actually wrote the blueprint for it in the 30s. He was a Polish Jew who, um, a brilliant um, lawyer and um, intellectual academic. Um, he was outside of Poland and so he survived the war, but many of his family members were killed in the Holocaust. At the end of the war, he drafted what became known as the Genocide Convention. And the originally, his draft of the convention included what he had called barbarism and vandalism as international crimes which could be prosecuted anywhere. Um, barbarism is what we today call genocide. Uh, vandalism, though, is destruction of culture and cultural heritage. So culture meaning language, um, as well as cultural heritage, books, manuscripts, archives, artworks, and the like. The references to vandalism, again, what we today might call cultural genocide, were removed from the convention, mostly at the request of countries like the United States that were afraid that including it would interfere with how the uh, American government had dealt particularly with minority communities in the United States, but particularly uh, with Native Americans. So cultural genocide has been used in recent times as a rhetorical flourish, I would say, but from a legal perspective by itself, uh, as genocide, it is not, um, it, it's not a thing, it doesn't really exist. But I'll come back to ways in which it is returning to us. Next slide, please. Um, I should mention also that the, it's really um, more than one convention, but in the late, in 1949, came the Geneva Conventions that are international humanitarian law uh, that regulate how war is to be conducted. In lines with what I discussed earlier with respect to the Libra Code. However, uh, cultural property and cultural heritage were omitted from the Geneva Conventions. And instead in 1954 was adopted a convention exclusively on the subject of the protection of cultural property in the event of armed conflict. Um, and it begins, um, actually the next um, slide, uh, defines cultural property uh, as cultural property that's of importance to, ah, um, it's, uh, click through again. There we go. I, I got a little fancy here. Uh, so it's objects that are of significance to the cultural heritage of all peoples. This has never been fully fleshed out definitionally but I will give you a couple of examples of what cultural property is. So this is an ancient vase. Some of you might recognize a very important one. Um, next slide, um, click again. Uh, this is one of the Altman paintings. So movable, tangible objects. This is the salt saliera made by the artist Cellini. Next, uh, religious um, elements. This is an altar from a church in Peru. And next is a manuscript that you can see here. So this is a variety of types of objects that would qualify. Um, more traditionally, we use the term cultural property, particularly in the United States, but the move internationally particularly is to refer to tangible, movable cultural objects or objects of cultural heritage. Next slide. So in addition to movable objects, we have immovable. So on the upper left, an historic structure, this is actually an ancient Roman structure. On the bottom left, a church in Cyprus. On the right, an archeological site. So these are all examples of immovable, tangible um, heritage. And then on the upper right, the British Museum, which is a repository, which might or might not on its own right, in its own right, qualify as cultural property, but does fall under the protection of the Hague Convention because it is a repository for movable cultural objects. All right, next slide. So some of the key provisions of the Hague Convention 
Article three, um, uh, we it comes in two parts, safeguarding and respect. Safeguard is positive actions that should be taken to protect cultural heritage. Positive actions should be taken during peacetime to prepare in case of armed conflict. And then respect for cultural property is things you should not do. Refrain from directing acts of hostility against cultural property, unless excused by what's called imperative military necessity. Unfortunately, the convention does not define that, although these terms are based on the actions of the US and the UK during the Second World War, including instructions that General Eisenhower gave just before the D-Day invasion, saying military necessity is not a matter of convenience. It has to be real necessity. Um, but this has not been spelled out in international law. And finally, under what not to do, uh, the convention prohibits and uh, calls on state parties to prevent theft, pillage, misappropriation, and vandalism of cultural heritage. Next slide. Um, Article seven calls on militaries to have provisions in their codes of conduct, their military manuals to ensure observance of the convention and also to have within the armed forces specialist personnel whose purpose is to secure respect for cultural property. In other words, to help in preserving cultural property um, and also to cooperate with the local civilian authorities that are responsible for safeguarding heritage. I'll also mention here uh, the two protocols. The first protocol, uh, 1954, same time as the main convention, and that refers to movable objects. It prohibits the removal of cultural property from occupied territory and imposes an obligation on states to return anything taken from occupied, occupied territory at the end of the conflict. Uh, the second protocol, which didn't come along until 1999, uh, does a couple of things. It adopts principles from the, Geneva, the, the protocols to the Geneva Conventions, what are called principles of proportionality, which means that it, even if you are justified in attacking cultural property, the uh, anticipated damage is proportionate to the expected military advantage. Feasibility to avoid harming uh, cultural heritage to the extent possible. And third, distinction that an army needs to know what is cultural, what is protected cultural property, what is a legitimate military target and what is not. Second, it requires, the second protocol requires uh, states parties to adopt criminal provisions for serious violations of the convention. And third, it, um, the convention, the main con uh, Hay Convention already adopted the blue shield that you see here over on the right that appears pretty consistently. Um, this is the internationally accepted symbol for protected cultural property and can also be used to protect cultural heritage workers and professionals. Um, but in the second protocol, Blue Shield International, the international umbrella organization is designated a consulting body to UNESCO and to what's called the second protocol committee. Um, go ahead. Um, just, um, I'm gonna give a little more history here. As we move into the Gulf War, the 2003 US led invasion of Iraq, and here you see an example of the Blue Shield painted on, it's on the roof of the Iraq Museum in the hope that it would signify this is protected cultural property not to be targeted. Um, next slide. We know that during the war in Iraq, um, many of you will remember that in Baghdad, as the US troops moved in, uh, there was a burning of the Iraq National Archives and also the library and the Iraq Museum was looted. Um, on a pretty large scale. Next slide. Followed by extensive looting of archeological sites throughout Southern Iraq of the Mesopotamian civilization, um, going back many, many millennia. You can see here, this is an aerial view of all of the looters pits. And um, depending on how large your screen is, you might be able to see some of the looters even uh, working at the site. Next slide. And we still see today objects that show up. This is a piece that was purchased by the Michael C. Carlos Museum at Emory University. It was purchased in 2006. Uh, it is a small ivory plaque of the Neo-Syrian period, um, roughly 8th century BCE. And it had been documented in the Iraq Museum 
Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the museum purchased it in 2006 without any provenance history. Um, it was returned to Iraq just about almost a year ago. Next slide. And from sites themselves, large scale looting, um, particularly from a site in Southern Iraq, cuneiform tablets, other objects you see in the upper left, and on the right, um, a tablet with a version of the Gilgamesh story, um, all from Iraq and um, purchased by the Hobby Lobby Corporation, uh, presumably for donation to the Museum of the Bible in Washington, DC. All of these were returned. Some 17,000 objects were returned to Iraq in the summer of 2021. Um, and on the right, uh, at the bottom, you see the Gilgamesh tablet as it is now in the museum back in Baghdad. Um, so we have the ongoing after effects of the war, even to today. Next slide. Now, another thing that came out of the war in Iraq was the founding of the US Committee of the Blue Shield, uh, in particular because the founding president, Corey Wagner, uh, was in the, she was actually a curator at the time uh, at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, but she was also a civil affairs officer and she was sent to the museum in Baghdad to help the um, Iraqis reconstruct the museum. And when she came home, uh, she founded the US Committee. Next slide. And just a few of the act activities that the US Committee has been involved in. First and foremost was for the US to ratify the Hague Convention. We signed it in 1954 and ultimately ratified it only in 2009. We still have not ratified either the first or the second protocol. Um, consideration of the second protocol is one of our goals. We promote US law and policy consistent with the Hague Convention. We coordinate with US military, the US government, and um, cultural heritage organizations to protect cultural property worldwide during armed conflict. And we now also um, have um, climate change within our purview. We assist in preparing what are called cultural inventories so that the military is aware of sites that are to be protected. And we try to do a lot of public outreach, including this lecture, for example, so that people become more familiar, not only with the US committee, but also with the general principles of protecting cultural heritage during armed conflict. Next slide. Um, one of our other activities after ratification of the convention was we worked on adoption of another law, the Protect and Preserve International Cultural Property Act of 2016, which was passed into law. It prohibited the import into the United States of objects from Syria. This was at the height of the conflict in Syria and taking over much of Syria and Northern Iraq by the, well, Eastern Syria and Northern Iraq by the Islamic State. And we know they were looting archeological sites and religious sites, um, particularly mosques on a pretty large scale. And we wanted to close off the US market to those objects. But the second part of the, um, this act was to establish what's called the Cultural Heritage Coordinating Committee which is housed in the State Department, but is coordinates um, altogether some 17 US federal agencies and other entities in our efforts internationally to protect cultural heritage. And the US Committee of the Blue Shield is included as a consultative body to the Cultural Heritage Coordinating Committee. Next slide. One of our other activities, um, just as an example was um, you see here, we assisted the Smithsonian Institute and the University of Pennsylvania Cultural Heritage Center in preparing these booklets uh, for the US military and for the Iraqi and Kurdish forces, first before the taking, the retaking of Mosul, and then the taking of Raqqa in Syria from the Islamic State. These booklets have images, they have brief explanations of international law, maps of the two cities, and were um, published in not just in English, but also in Arabic and Kurdish. And these were distributed to the forces and seemed to be quite popular with them. Nothing was perfect. Things were still destroyed, particularly I believe in Raqqa, but we hope that this at least helped to um, minimize that type of damage and destruction. Next slide. Um, to a few aspects of international law that I wanna come back to um, before I conclude. First is the question of accountability. And for this, I'm only looking at the, the, the top paragraph, well, the slide will come back. 
The 1954 Hague Convention by itself has no particular enforcement mechanism. It calls on each state party to adopt their own military regulations, um, including criminal provisions for violation of the convention's um, principles. Um, the second protocol, as I mentioned, increases that and a state that um, implement, that ratifies and implements the second protocol need, must adopt domestic implementing legislation for criminal provisions. Also, um, in this time, uh, we the UN, United Nations um, Security Council used to establish ad hoc criminal tribunals, and there'd be one for each conflict. Um, and the one that was relevant to what we're doing is the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the ICTY. Next slide. During the Balkan conflict of the 1990s, um, a lot of cultural heritage was destroyed or damaged. Um, in one case uh, involving Dubrovnik, uh, what today is in Croatia on the Adriatic coast, Serbian naval, naval officers um, bombarded the historic core, what had already been um, accepted as a World Heritage Site before the conflict. Um, there was damage done and the Serbian naval officers were later prosecuted by the ICTY, not just for this damage to cultural heritage, but for many other bad things. And most prosecutions that do involve cultural heritage, usually with one exception, involve a lot of other uh, very bad things like murder, rape, torture, and the like. Um, so Dubrovnik was one example where there was some accountability for damage done to cultural heritage. Next slide. However, in contrast, um, there was also a prosecution of Croatian forces for the destruction of the bridge at Mostar, which is um, in Bosnia-Herzegovina. The bridge was highly significant to the local Croatian and Bosniak populations. It was built in the 1500s during the rule of Suleiman the Magnificent when this was part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the bridge was destroyed and originally the Croatian commanders who again were prosecuted for a lot of other very bad things, um, they were convicted. But on appeal, the part of their conviction uh, for destruction of the bridge was reversed because the bridge was viewed as a legitimate military target um, because it had been used by the Bosnian forces to carry supplies back and forth across the bridge um, uh, between the two sides of the river. Um, so it's unfortunate that was a backward step. The trial court had brought into account the idea of proportionality, that the destruction of the bridge had a very, uh, very large historic impact, but also psychological impact on the population in Mostar. And the appellate, uh, the, the Appellate court found that the use of proportionality was not appropriate, that once it became a legitimate military target, proportionality didn't matter. This is before the second protocol uh, was adopted. Um, again, there's a lot of ins and outs to that, but um, that was certainly a setback. Next slide. Um, in 1998 was established the International Criminal Court under what's known as the Rome Statute. So now we have a standing international court that addresses uh, the conduct of armed conflict. Again, not just for cultural property by any means. Um, and it applies to, uh, this is an important point, it establishes criminal responsibility, but it only applies after a state has ratified the REM statute. Although, it allows a non-state party to accept the court's jurisdiction. And I'm gonna conclude by talking a bit about Ukraine. Um, that is what Ukraine has done, has accepted the court's jurisdiction um, during not just the current conflict, actually going back to 2014. The Rome statute sets up three levels of crimes. First is the crime of genocide, um, based on the genocide convention, which I've already discussed. Uh, second, crimes against humanity where the targeting of cultural and religious sites may be evidence of an intent to persecute a particular ethnic um, or other population group. But in both the cases of genocide and crimes against humanity, destruction of cultural property, 
by itself is not included under those definitions. However, the third category, war crimes, includes the intentionally directing attacks against civilian objects Buildings dedicated to religion, education, art, science, or historic monuments, provided they are not military objectives. The wording of this is a little problematic for a couple of reasons. Um, it really takes us back 100 years to the early Hague Conventions um, and is a very narrow definition. It's only about attacking immovable um, structures. So it's a narrow category of cultural property and a narrow category of actions that are covered by that which again is somewhat problematic. Next slide. In one case, and it's the only case where somebody was prosecuted only for destruction of cultural property, involved the destruction of religious structures um, at, in uh, Timbuktu in Mali in 2012, after there was um, a separatist movement and a, an affiliate of Al Qaeda moved in and um, one of the leaders of that uh, group um, led the destruction of these mosques and um, other uh, shrines that were very significant to the local population and also to the larger uh, area of the country of Mali and regionally and even globally. Um, these are very significant historic sites. Um, so uh, this is the only standalone prosecution for cultural property destruction. And in fact, the defendant pled guilty. So there was not really a full litigation. Um, some people believe it was wrongful for him to be prosecuted because this was not done in the context of armed conflict. Um, but others have interpreted it as a broader uh, view that there was conflict going on. So this is one of the questions of international law, which is not really resolved, is what, um, to what extent does a conflict extend beyond uh, the actual like heat of battle uh, type of action? Um, because if it's defined very narrowly, as seems to be the case, there's another case uh, before the International Criminal Court that did not involve cultural property where the court gave a fairly narrow definition to what armed conflict consists of. Um, so this is an uh, ongoing debate uh, area of development of international law, which could have um, great significance. Uh, next slide. And that returns me to the situation in Ukraine. I already talked about the Mariupol theater and the killing of the people in the theater. Uh, they did not seem to be a legitimate military target at all, uh, but a refuge for civilians to take where they thought they would be protected. Next slide. And I'm gonna use <laughs> this slide and the next uh, one or two to illustrate um, a couple of the points about how we have moved from the aftermath of the war in Iraq in 2003 was really the beginning of the use of aerial um, forms of remote sensing, primarily aerial surveillance, surveillance things from drones, um, satellite imagery to document destruction and damage that was done. And it was very effective for documenting the looting of archeological sites in Southern Iraq for a number of reasons. But we have now advanced significantly in now what is close to 20, over 20 years um, in our understanding that is not enough to document destruction of heritage itself. So I use this example and there are many people to thank for sharing um, this, but particularly Dr. Hayden Bassett, whom we're gonna hear from in a moment if the technology works. This is an aerial view of a museum located just north of Kyiv, um, which came, uh, if you remember, the Russians originally advanced from the north um, to try to take Kyiv early on in the conflict just about two years ago now. Um, and this is an aerial view of a museum in that yellow circle. So this is just before the war started, you can see it all intact. Next slide. And you can see that now the museum there is uh, bombed out. The, the roof is gone. Now, if possible, could you try to play the video? Hmm. I am not hearing it. 
Now, important to us in, in this case and other cases is we recognize that it's no longer sufficient to just say impacted or not. Um, at the end of the day, that helps um, uh, a few uh, stakeholders, a few missions in order to prioritize when and where something needs to be responded to. Um, but also we need to focus on the, con the context of impact. We can collect some of that information from open sources, formal media, um, and things like that. But we can also leverage the imagery we have in front of us to make some of those determinations as well. Um, and I, I should say not make determinations, but make inferences um, about what might be happening. In this case, you can look at something like the immediate, immediately surrounding buildings, all residential in this case, uh, the immediately surrounding uh, landscape, the trees, the vegetation, and identify that you know, very few, if any, of the surrounding environment has been impacted. It is really confined to the building itself. And while a, a, an image can never tell us, an image alone can never tell us uh, intent, for why cultural heritage is, is being impacted, we can begin to infer and use this as just one piece of independent evidence, an independent line of evidence to suggest that this might not be collateral. Again, we can't make that determination from the image itself or the image alone, but it does add uh, one piece to that conversation. So thank you, Dr. Bassett. Um, from the Virginia Museum, of uh, natural history, who is working or was working at the time with the Smithsonian and the State Department on documentation of um, heritage destruction in Ukraine. <laughs> but the point that he makes, it, it's no longer, and certainly from an international law perspective, is not sufficient to say that a site was destroyed or damaged. We need to know more of the circumstances of how, when, why, who um, was involved in that destruction. So um, we are still, I think, in the infancy of being able to doc, not just to document heritage destruction, but to document for the purpose of particularly what I'm interested in is the possibility of war crimes prosecutions. Um, next slide. Now, why might that museum have been uh, targeted? It was a museum devoted particularly to the works of one artist, Maria Primachenko who uh, was uh, an artist in Ukraine in a sort of primitive style. You see here an example of one of her works, who was viewed uh, in the Soviet era as somewhat anti-Soviet. So it is possible, we don't know, uh, it is possible that the museum was targeted for a political purpose, assuming that it was in fact targeted. So there's a lot we don't know, and this is just one example of that. Next slide. However, uh, the documentation has also been able to help. Um, this is an image, <coughs> uh, again, an aerial view of the Kherson Regional Art Museum. So Kherson is located not far from the Crimean Peninsula. It was originally taken over by the Russians early in the conflict. And then in November of 2022, the Russians withdrew from, uh, from Kherson. And what was documented, and these yellow um, arrows point to white vans that pulled up to the museum and removed artworks from the museum and took them back to Crimea, which has been occupied by Russia since 2014. Now, the Russians claim that it took them for purpose of safeguarding them because it was expected that Kherson would become an area of conflict, which is true, it is. Um, but it was taken to occupy territory. Uh, which really is still Ukrainian territory. And since 2014, objects have been removed from museums in Crimea and taken to Russia, particularly to the Hermitage uh, Museum in St. Petersburg. So this taking of these artworks, and there has been, been views on Facebooks and social media showing some of those works in museums in Crimea. Um, so Russia says they are um, justified in taking them. Uh, I think most of the rest of the world uh, would disagree with that. So this is a very current issue, how we interpret these international legal instruments, um, how we try to assess responsibility and accountability are all very open questions. And I hope someday uh, that not only will the Ukrainian conflict end, but that it will help to expand upon, elaborate, help us understand better what international law can and cannot do.
Um, next slide. And I think that's it. So I'm going to thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to take uh, questions that may have come in during the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. We do have a few questions that have come in. I'm going to stop sharing so that we can be in conversation. Uh, one question that came in uh, says, how does the Iraqi Jewish archive that was found in the Mukhabarat offices, forgive my pronunciation, during the war fit into legal paradigms you've discussed? Did the US Army loot it, in quotation marks, um, and how is ownership of it being determined? Hmm. Yes. <laughs> so what happened was, uh, so the Mukhabarat was the Iraqi secret police. And when uh, the Jewish population, which had been in Iraq you know, for over 2,500 years, um, was forced to leave or left, uh, they had to leave most of their possessions behind. And the secret police took them. Um, and in the 2003 war, the um, pipes were burst by probably by the US military and they became waterlogged and needed to be conserved. Um, there were lots of other things that needed desperate conservation as well, I will say. So singling out, um, and I don't like the use, I know they're called the Iraqi Jewish archives, but it's not an archive. No, archive means something that has been intentionally collected together and bears some internal coherence. It's not an archive. It's really a miscellaneous, miscellaneous over a couple of hundred years of things from religious texts, particularly from the 18th century and on, to things like school report cards from the mid and early part of the 20th century. Um, so it's not an archive as we would think about it. Um, so the decision the US military wanted to take the objects back to the United States to be conserved. Um, and at the time, the United States was recognized as the occupying power. There was a UN Security Council resolution in May of 2003, um, which recognized the US as the occupying power. An occupying power has the ability to do anything that the local government would have the ability to do. And so essentially the United States signed an agreement, um, two different parts of the US government were on the two sides of the agreement. One side acting as the occupying power on behalf of the Iraqi nation and the other side being the US government in its own right. Um, so this collection, uh, several thousand um, written materials of, of, as I said, all sorts were brought to the United States. It's been, you know, over 20 years. Uh, they have been conserved extensively. They're housed at the National Archives in outside of DC. They have been, um, originally the United States was supposed to return them after a year. Off and on, the agreement has been extended. The latest extension was already a couple of years ago. Uh, there's been no formal extension, um, but they are still in the United States. Some of the religious texts that were more damaged, there was a ceremonial burying, if you know that um, religious texts are not just thrown away. Um, so uh, most of the Iraqi Jewish community that's in the United States is in the New York area. So this was done in New York. And the Iraqi ambassador to the United States at the time attended that ceremony, participated in it. Um, so right now there's kind of a status quo i would say um and most of it if not all of the um, pieces have been digitized so whatever happens to the original um, works themselves the information is all there it's all been as i said digitized i believe it's all available on the web if you go to the national archives website um i think i mean there's obviously a good argument for keeping them in the united states where there's an extensive iraqi jewish community there's also of course one in israel um there's not much of a iraqi jewish community in iraq probably none at this point um, but there's definitely a, a jewish presence particularly in the north there are shrines and the like and there is an argument to say that at least some of them should go back to iraq to remind the iraqis that they used to be a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, tolerant society, and that maybe it would be nice to have that element represented there as well. So, you know, there are many sides to the argument. I would say there's no specific resolution at the moment. 
That is a good lead into our next question. Um, our guest says that from 1948 to 1970 in the Middle East, Jews were forced to leave and a lot of properties were confiscated by governments and that Jews had both movable and non-movable properties, including priceless items. What could be done to recover any of these objects which represent religious and cultural heritage and can any or can any of them be recovered um, and, and where do they belong? Well, where they belong, again, is a combination of, um, <clears throat> in some cases, there are still the original owners or immediate descendants of the original owners. And I think things that were their own personal property should be returned to them. Um, should. I'm not saying it will, but you know, should. And again, I th now, there's not actually in several of the countries where um, Jews left, to my understanding, in several of these countries like Libya, like Algeria, um, I think probably Yemen, uh, there really isn't much, especially movable cultural Jewish property left. Either it was taken or perhaps destroyed. I don't think um, there's much there at this point in time to be recovered. Um, there is to me a little bit of similarity to what happened in Germany at the end of the Second, Second World War in that the things that are still being litigated over today are not the things that were in Germany at the end of the war, but things that left and are now in the hands of third party, you know, museums, collectors, whatever, not the original perpetrators, perpetrators of the thefts. I would like to see, um, and I don't want to get into too much detail about this because it's really getting into the weeds, but the U.S. does have cultural property agreements with several countries um, to, restrict the, to restrict the import into the United States of illegally exported cultural objects, particularly archaeological and ethnological objects. I would like to see the U U.S. use some of that leverage through those agreements to encourage the countries. It's not, as I said, about the movable objects that might still be in those countries. For the most part, it's really about immovable. So there are cemeteries, there are synagogues, there are other Jewish um, communal structures that are still there. Um, and I would like to see the leverage used to protect uh, that immovable heritage because there's no other way of protecting it. You know, it's not like you don't want to go can't go selling off, you know, take a synagogue apart and sell off the pieces. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. So I would like the focus to be on preserving the immovable heritage that's still in those countries. As far as recovering the actual um, like land that might have been owned and the like, I think that's also very difficult. There are many people trying to recover things in Europe, uh, whether at the end of the Second World War or as a result of the communist era, uh, era and it's very, very difficult whether it's in the Arab world or in the European world. Oops, I am not hearing you. You would think after four years, I would know how to unmute myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> we do not have any further questions in our Q&A. So I will say thank you very much for joining us tonight for this really thought provoking lecture and this discussion. Um, and we hope to be able to invite you to the Magnus in person sometime in the future. And I hope I will be there as well, um, visiting family and otherwise. So, um, and I look forward to that. And again, I really, really want to thank you for your flexibility of switching over to um, the Zoom format on very short notice. My pleasure. And I want to say thank you to all of our guests who have joined us tonight. Thank you for for joining us on Zoom and for your flexibility as well with our scheduling. Um, please come visit us in person when you're able and have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you. Be safe, be well.